Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, episode number 55. Lamar Smith and Brush Country Monsters. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Jackie Bushman of Buckmasters. You're listening to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott from the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, your host, and I'm here with my field correspondent from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. Dusty, what's going on, man? Yo, 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 what's happening? It's summer humidity, um, summertime. I'm taking bike rides, and I'm seeing bucks, and they're blowing like crazy. And uh, I don't know if they're little ones running around, but I'm, I'm actually just getting out this time of year and uh i'm finding wildlife like crazy bears and deer and it's it's awesome you know it's a great time to be outside you know the weather's right as long as you can stay out of the chiggers and the ticks yep it's a good time out in the outdoors right now it really is and things I, are things are happening things are happening and i uh I'm, I'm finding that the stealth of a mountain bike is really getting me close to animals in ways that i almost can't even do on foot for some reason they don't recognize the bicycle as a threat but I think they hear walking, it's a threat. They hear a four-wheeler, can become a little more spookish. But I, I, I literally could have ridden up on two black bears walking down the bike trail the other day. That's crazy. Yeah, just nuts. So um, we got a great guest on the show today, Dusty. We always have great guests, yeah. Jay. Good point. Very good point. We would only have good guests because that's what you deserve if you're listening to the show. And uh, this week's guest is Lamar Smith from Brush Country Monsters. You ever hunted in Texas, Dusty? No, I, I've, I've never actually visited Texas. So this is all going to be new to me, and I'm excited. I am too, and it's stuff that I someday I'll hunt Texas. And I always see those great pictures with the, you know, the the just on the prairie kind of thing where there's just lots of tumbleweed. And, and small small brush, but it looks like I don't want to go in there. I don't want to go into that brush country because it's just going to tear you up. Um, but that's where the big bucks roam down there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a uh, it's a different way of hunting that uh, you know it'd be all new. It'd be totally different than what I'm used to. It'd be out of my box. Yeah, but it'd be in a, it'd be interesting. It would be interesting. And Lamar. He he's just looks like a big guy, and if you look at some of the pictures, he looks very intimidating because he has the goatee and kind of a balding head, and he looks kind of kind of like man, I don't want to mess with that guy. But after you talk to him, he's like just a teddy bear, just a real super nice guy. But he knows the ranch that he hunts. He knows how to hunt. He's been hunting whitetail for a long time, and he's really this. He's the guide. He's the one uh, doing the the opening commentaries on the show that he does um, with a, a whole group of others, but. I mean, he knows his stuff like nobody else. Yeah, you know, it's going to be some great information on a different area that we've never really got into. Yeah, exactly. And I'm I'm really excited to have him on. So let's uh, let's let's just turn turn the channel and get him on here. Let's do it. Lamar Smith, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Well, thanks. I've been looking forward to this. I hope, uh, hope we have a good show. Well, I've been I've been uh, looking forward to this for a while too, since we talked or talked a little while back, and uh, realized that your group on Facebook has a very similar liking to our group on Facebook, and that we should probably explore this a little further. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's one of those deals where you scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours, and we're both scratching the back that loves the outdoors and and loves hunting and fishing, and uh, I think we could uh, we could become fast friends pretty quick. Uh, absolutely, and we are all about the outdoors. We're all about hunting and just enjoying the experiences, but even more so, we're finding that we're, we're enjoying meeting the people in the industry um, there, like yourself that are doing great things right. across the country. That's almost even more uh, impressive than the, the actual uh, hunting that we're, we're watching and, and taking part in. Right, right. I enjoy you know any of my destination hunts or even when 
I have clients come uh, down to the No Hills Ranch that I've managed for the last 18 years. It's always nice to meet people, and um, I tell most people that hunters, for the most part, are all good guys that you want to be friends with. And in 18, for example of that, for 18 years running the No Hills Ranch, we've only had three people that we requested not to come back, and that's pretty good. Crew, pretty good record. That's fantastic, um, Lamar. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I w- let's go back to like childhood. Who are you? Where are you from? Uh, well, I'm uh, from deep South Texas. Uh, if you're young enough to know what Spring Break is, that's one of the destinations. Is about it's called South Padre Island, and uh, it's about 45 miles to my east where I grew up. Hmm. Uh, I'm a third generation cotton farmer and grain farmer. Uh, we grow uh, cotton and grain sorghum on dry land. We depend on God's water. Um, the Rio Grande Valley where I grew up uh, is tropical. Uh, one of the only areas one of the only three areas in the country where you can grow winter vegetables. Um, been a farmer all my life uh, and uh, lost my dad at a young age But uh, when I was 13, but I had him long enough and still in me the joy of the outdoors, the hunting and the fishing. And, uh, it's one of the best places in the country to grow up hunting and fishing. You've got uh, the Gulf of Mexico right there. You've got uh, some of the best deer hunting, uh, some of the best quail hunting, uh, dove and white wing hunting. We've got duck hunting. It's just a great place uh, to be ready raised and to raise my kids uh and uh just i love being down there it, it's uh getting a little tough a little bit right now with some of the, the problems that mexico's having but you know any country any area like that's gonna have some growing pains through if you last long enough sure sure well it you just described a place that sounds like a place i would love to go to and hang out and probably live at um uh, and the farming dusty you, dusty is a, a farmer from ohio he understands all that stuff oh absolutely you know we're more of a soybean and field corn operation, but, uh, you know, I can definitely relate, and uh, that's no easy life by far. Right. Uh, well, you know, when, when farming the last few years, as you can probably attest to, Dusty, you know, agriculture has gotten pretty tough, and uh, I uh, had to get some priorities straight all along about 18 years ago, and we had to quit hunting because farming got tough. My boys were old, and I, I raised three boys, uh, and uh, they're all uh, still very close to me, and two of them still live down there. One of them lives in Austin, and um, it's just a, a great place to, to raise the kids doing that. But when I, I got to a point where the boys had already killed, you know, all the little basket rack eight points they needed to, that it's time to become a trophy hunter and a legit hunter. And um, I, we quit hunting, and then after about three years of that, um, the Stocking family, which has the Novios Ranch, came to me and said, uh, me and a friend of mine, said, uh, you know, we know y'all aren't hunting anymore, but we're going to start a hunting operation to help supplement the income on these uh, ranch up here, and we'd like to know if y'all be interested in doing it. And the rest is history. I've been there for 18 years. They helped me put your kid through college, and I've got uh, 5,000 acres I can run on anytime I want. Can't shoot what I want, but you know, when you get into the management stuff, uh, that you can you can turn. You know, I'm 62 years old now, and you know I don't have to kill a big deer every year. Uh, you know, I get into the management end of it. You manage does, you manage inferior genetic, and uh, it's still hunting. It's just uh, you're not hunting great big horns. You're growing them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It uh, it sounds like you got a pretty good setup down there. Um, and who is the family that owns the ranch again? Uh, the family that owns it is the Scoggins Ranch. They're their main business. Uh, they're in agriculture. They farm uh, and they grow grain sorghum for the cattle operation that they have. And, the, and the, it's a specific cattle operation. It's a feed yard. Mm. Uh, it's called Star Feed Yard, and it's the biggest one south of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, it's about twenty-two thousand head. And then uh, when they buy these cattle all over the country in Mexico, they buy them as calves and they bring them in. They'll condition them out on these ranches. Uh, and uh, what we do is we hunt those ranches as well, and it's just an added income that they, they can have to help keep you know uh, the, the operation going on a level that they need to. The more they can eat out in the wild, the less they have to feed them, and the more money they make when they sell them. Right, gotcha. So the grain sorghum itself is is more or less feed for the cattle. Correct, correct. It's uh, Most of our production of the grain sorghum is for feed cattle or chicken feed. A lot of it goes to Mexico, uh, but it's a, it, it, it's a, it's just like a ride around there with corn, you know. Gotcha. Um, let's talk about your, your crew you're working with, Lamar. Um, who is John Burrell? John Burrell is a uh, outfitter in uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. He's uh, He has a high adventure company. He can book you just about anywhere in the world you want to go. Uh, and it doesn't have to be hunting. Uh, he's got some fish camp. Uh, he's got some photography uh, safaris that he booked in Mexico. Uh, he, he can send you to New Zealand, Argentina, uh, Africa, uh, Canada, uh, you know, anywhere in the United States to hunt just about 
about anything you want if you you know and he uh he does it very well he's been uh he's got several awards uh that you know, i tout him being as good as he is and he's got a reputation for taking care of the client very cool and how about pam how do you pronounce pam's last name pam's eight uh pam's pam is uh pam was with pam was with us early uh she's uh they've kind of backed off the uh she had she, she safari which was a clothing line for women mm. and um uh, i still work with her husband and uh, uh their sons a little bit and they still come down and hunt with us uh but the pam's taking a little bit different direction and they uh i think they've sold uh the she, she safari to somebody and so they're not involved with that uh, that deal has kind of run its course but uh she was a sweetheart i mean i just love working with her and she helped us get the tv show off the ground just by being able to ride her coattails and um every you know if you ever watch her on tv she's just like that in person she's a real sweetheart gotcha now how did you get coined the super guide <laughs> <laughs> well i'm i'm not uh, i'm not any better than the next good guy uh, i like to think i'm a good guy but um there was a friend of mine that has hunt with me ever since i've been the guide which was 18 years and uh it'd be from uh, new jersey and he just came up with it one day and uh you know how deer camp can get you know if you get something you can needle somebody about well he made that comment and everybody oh you're a super guy you said well before long that stuck and uh, <laughs> uh now they just call, you know my good friends and, and the guys that'll call me super and then uh, i know what they're talking about uh, uh but my my hunting partner there frank davis that i run the novios with and some of the guys out there they'll they'll say super guys but they got their tongue so far in their cheek that you know they're trying not to gag on it <laughs> gotcha now, Lamar, you, your pictures online, you, you look like a, a, a pretty intimidating character. You've got the... What? You got you got well, the I'm, goatee. I'm, Is that you? Is that really who you are, or are you? I mean, talking to you, you sound like I'm, you're just a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. I am. I'm happy, very happy-go-lucky. I, I got you know, I, I can be friends with anybody, and I'm not shy. One of the reasons I can do what I do is because I'm not shy. I mean, I am two four and a half. I weigh about two forty. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm, uh, if I look intimidating, you know, surely my file will make it where it's not quite the mean. But I'm uh, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Okay. I sound like. Uh, we're bringing out the teddy bear Eddie here, explaining himself. I think so too. I think that's true. Um, like the, the picture on your Facebook page, it, it looks pretty warm and inviting. But the one on your media kit, you, you're looking kind of badass, to be honest. It's just the okay. way. <laughs> Well, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when you when you get a camera shoved in your face, they, they, they'll say, all right, that's enough smiling. They want some smiling, some grinning, some looking really mean or some concentrating. And maybe I have a hard time going from concentrating to looking mean. Or maybe my concentration look is a mean look. Gotcha. Yeah, it's it's all it's all for the, the pub- publicity, really. But the interview, you sound right. like a pretty nice guy. I like to think I'm a pretty nice guy. Very cool. Now you're you're a whitetail fanatic. Is that accurate to say? Well, it, it's fair. I mean, uh, probably more fanatical than when I was younger. Uh, you know, as you get older, you kind of mellow a little bit. But you know, as I got into the the uh, guiding business and and helping the Toggins raise some deer on his ranches and, and learning how to manage a herd, uh, you know, that that takes over some of it. You know, I can. You know, I'm just like anybody. I'd love to shoot a 180 every year. But if I can shoot a 140, that takes years old and he used to be a 180 you know how much you know the, the, the management takes over and how much did, of his genetic did he used to see out there that i'm gonna be able to hunt for for the next four or five six years right uh it's it, you just got a little bit different level of, of what you're what you're hunting for I, I love i get just as much thrill of killing an old mature buck that's had his reign here uh, than i do killing a monster buck gotcha that's fantastic now the the area of texas that you're hunting is considered the brush country correct Correct. Why is it called that? It's, uh, well, uh, it's just always been that ever since I was growing up. It's, uh, the South Texas brush is uh, it's pretty thick, and everything will stick you and prick you. Uh, it's harsh country, uh, you know, it, it, and that's where the big deer are in South Texas. Now, in Central Texas, uh, around Austin and San Antonio, uh, and a little bit west and north of there, uh, they're called the hill country deer. We've got a different class of deer in there. Hmm. Uh, they can be, uh, you know, a big buck over there will be, you know, 125. 
five and then a hundred and pound, you know, field dress. Uh, but where we're hunting down there because of the genetic we've incorporated, now I don't say incorporated, we've raised. We have never put a different strand except the local deer in there uh, in the 18 years. I mean, we're we're killing deer that'll field dress 200 pounds. Wow. Okay. So you're you're shooting the big deer and the and yeah. where you are. Right. And it, right. It, is it? Can you attribute it to the management of the whitetail in that area? Yeah, you can. It's uh, you know, it, you start with good genetics, and then what those caucus did when they got this place, um, they uh, they brought it down to almost bare bones. Uh, there's you know. There's different people will tell you how a ranch got to where it is. Uh, some will say it's food plot. Some will say it's God-given brush that we have that have full of protein. Uh, some people, uh, you know, or, or say it's the protein we feed them, uh, you know, in the trial. But what, all those things work, and they add to it, and we do all those things. But the biggest single thing that I think has helped our deer herd get to where it is is uh, taking out inferior genetics. Um, if you have a deer, for the first four or five years that I work at the Novils, uh, a three year old eight point died as a management deer or a uh, for lack of a better word a cull. Uh, we did yeah. we had such a prevalent eight point genetic in that herd everything was eight point so we started taking out that you know and you can always find a kid or go to church and there's always a kid that'll come out or your kids or you know and you can find those deer and get them out of the herd before too long we started seeing less eight points and more ten points but bigger eight point and and the same thing with a twelve point a twelve point for the first ten years died of old age wow. uh, the only time the only time we shot a 12 point was if he was out there with a hot doe and a couple other bucks were chasing him and he wasn't paying attention. You know, right. he was just eating, you know, browse. So then we could take an eight point, I mean, a 12 point. But before too long, we started seeing more 12 points. Um, you know, Texas is a just different beast in the fact that we can manage a herd like that because we have ranches that basically aren't public. There's so much public land in all these other states uh, that, you know, all almost all of Texas is privately owned. Is that right? No kidding. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, come up when 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 I go on my destination hunt, uh, we, we, and we get some uh, we get we get some heat sometime for you know the way we hunt. Uh, but it you know it, it's what God gave us to hunt. I mean, if if you see a five thousand acre block of brush in Texas, if you don't have a road in it, you're not going to kill a deer because it, it's flat. You don't have the draws. You don't have the hills. Uh, you don't have farm fields in between the brush rows in the in the low spot. Uh, so it's just real thick brush, and everything's got a sticker on it. If you don't have a road in there, you're not going to shoot a deer. Right. It's. I've seen that in other spots of the country where if you don't have a road, you might as well forget about it because you're not right, you're not right, going to go in there. Right, exactly. And you can't go in there because you know they'll whip you every time. They'll hear you before you get 15 feet in there because you're going to make so much noise. Right. Uh, and you know, and you're going to kill a deer in several areas. You're going to kill him in the kitchen. You're going to kill him in the bedroom. Or you're going to kill him going in between. Right. Uh, and it's just because we have a road out there, and he crosses that road, and we shoot him. That's the same thing as walking out into a field in Missouri. If he leaves the brush and goes out in the field to chase a doe, that's when you kill it. Right. You're you're not going to be given the opportunity to like stalk a deer in the brush country because you'll tear it's your legs off. Not, not in the brush country. Right. Not uh, not in the brush country. You, you just can't do it. Right. Uh, uh, but there, I'm not saying 100 percent of the country is like that. You know, we have right. some hill country stuff. We got some stuff out in West Texas that you do that. Uh, but down here in the brush country where the no wheels is, and everything from say San Antonio to Del Rio to Laredo and back to King. Enough is that brush country that you're not going to shoot anything unless you're on a road. Right, that, that's interesting. It is interesting, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's it's not like hunting the Northeast or Ohio. Right. And I mean, it's a different, right. it's, it's different landscape altogether. It's just it's a very well, unique I, area. Know, it, right, it, it, and the way I explain it to people that it's probably the same people that send us an email every now and then that talks about the way we hunt. Uh, we can use corn in Texas, right. uh, but and you know, there's other ways, there's other places that hunt other things that I don't necessarily agree with, but what I do is I just don't go there and hunt. Gotcha. But this country down here, one of the things that, you know, agriculture got tough, and these these ranches have been in these families for generations, and these owners have an opportunity to raise deer and sell them and keep a family farm or a family ranch in that family for the next generation, and who are, who is anybody that can poo-poo that and, and fuss about it and say that's not right? Uh, it's, it's the way God built it down here. Uh, God didn't build us like Missouri or Kansas or Nebraska. Uh, he built it like Texas. Right. So that's where I am, and that's the way we hunt. Well, I think one of the beauties of the, of the United States is that it's so diverse in not only the people, but in the landscape and, and uh, 
culture and, and just every place that you go, you can hunt a different way. And Texas is just one of those unique places. Can you imagine if yeah. all hunting was the same in every spot in the, no, in the no, country? It'd be awful. No, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be terrible. And, you know, Texas is so diverse. Down there where, where we just finished talking about is the brush country. And then you got West Texas, which is deep canyons and rock. And, you know, it, it looks like it grows rock and everything. And there you can spot and talk. And they got whitetail and mule deer. Right. And then you got the panhandle up there that's got the same kind of canyons and different country and it looks a little bit more like a like a kansas or a oklahoma uh where you can hunt some draws and things that, that are a little bit different and then you got the hill country uh that that's a smaller deer uh but it's it, it's like the south texas brush country but it's hilly right uh, and so sometimes you get an opportunity there and then you got east texas which is forest right so you just about got it all in texas and that's the beauty of texas it's like its own uh, mini united states in a way because there's so many different yeah, it, variables it, 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 you're not going to ask me if we should succeed, are you? I'm not going to ask you that. No, this, we're, this is not a political show. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, you, well, we could. you could, you got everything you need down there. Really, you could, but I, I, I think the rest of the country relies on Texas a little too much. Yeah, you know. a great place to live, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But I enjoy going everywhere else, to look around. Here. That's pretty cool. So let's, uh, Lamar, if you could. I mean, you've been on a lot of deer hunts um, over the years, and you've probably hunted with some amazing people. Um, any anybody in particular stick out as some people that um, you enjoyed hunting with more than others? Well, I always enjoyed hunting with my dad. Uh, and I, like I said, I, I lost him when I was 13. Uh, he was a, a, a world champion type shotgun shot, uh, and he loved to deer hunt as well. And uh, he concealed in me, he took me almost every time he could, and he taught me to rattle. And that's my forte. That's the way I love to hunt. I love to go out there and, and fool a big buck and to come into me in his house. And I don't even have to kill him most of the time. Gotcha. Uh, it's just as long as I can fool him and get him. Uh, you know, I've uh, I've had some uh, friends that I've hunted with all my life. A guy that runs with me, uh, that runs the no wheels with me, Frank Davis. You know, I go on any kind of hunt in the world with him. He's uh, uh, he's been with me for the whole ride here, and we farm together and farm next to each other, and we also like to hunt together. And I love to quail hunt with him, and we dove hunt. Uh, and then there's there's a there's a core group of older men that some are with us and some aren't now. That when I me and my brother were my brother's four years younger than me and when my dad died they made it a point to take us hunting every year uh, and uh in, in my later years and as they got older i made a point to repay them and i took them places and i would go anywhere they wanted to go and i would clean every deer and i would do everything just a small way to repay them for what they did to me for me and my brother when we were younger uh, those are probably the, the main guys and and of course uh i've got uh, three sons and and i can almost repeat every hunt i've ever had with them for because i just loved hunting with them too that's yeah. awesome Okay. Ain't that something though? I have trouble remembering my neighbor my neighbor's name sometimes, but I can remember every white tail hunt I've ever been on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can remember it with my boys, and I can remember what, you know, and, and the thing about it is, you'll, you'll think of one, something will trigger a thought, and before you know it, you hadn't thought of that hunt in a few years, but there, it's still there. It seems to never leave you. Right. That's, that's you know, that's that's what's unique about hunting in general, and when you involve your family and your friends, it, it sticks with you. Great, great life. Uh, it, yeah, it does. And, and you know, <laughs> but the, the ones that sometimes pop back into mind I wish I could forget is the ones I either missed or screwed up on and didn't get right <laughs> <laughs> because it's my fault. Those, those kind of fit in your memory, too. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, some of them are the best hunts you've ever been on also. You're right. You're exactly right. You're yeah. exactly right. Lamar, speaking of hunts, let's let's. do you have a favorite hunt that you've been on? Oh, you know, I, I, can, I can go back when I was a kid, but I really wasn't much of a hunter then. I was following my dad. I can remember uh, the year before he died, we we, we jumped three bucks, and uh, uh, we were in a flat area, and before they got over a ridge, uh, we dropped two of them, and I thought I was shooting the biggest one, uh, but my dad shot the biggest one, uh, which was about a 168 point, and I had a 10 point that went about 148, and um, I got both those deer on the wall, because that's the last time I did it with him. And, but if you want to talk about me, um, I guess, you know, I was, it was about three or four years ago. It was one of my better hunts when I uh, was in Montana, and I was with Mike Zemeck of Blue Rock Outfitters. And I've become pretty fast friends with our producer of the TV show. Yeah. And he and I were out there, and we had been, we were going to be there for five days, and it was the first time we'd ever uh, set up with Mike. We had met, met him at a trade show and uh, on recommendation. And so we made a deal with Mike to come out there to make a show on his place and promote his ranch. 
much. Uh, the very first afternoon, uh, we're, I actually it was the morning. We were going through a little bottom coming up and Mike is looking at Mike is America is looking out the left window and Seth and I are in the right seat. And, uh, he pulled up his little over uh, kind of a lot, not a bridge, but a natural bridge over a ravine. And Mike's looking to the left and he's saying, I don't see anything around here. And I know these deer are here. And it wasn't, they, they come out of this ravine about 50 yards from us. And Seth said, well, here's a buck. And we turned and looked and I mean, it was a really nice old, uh, full, you know, four by four, and he had one real long D1, mm. and, you know, mule deer don't have that. And one thing or other, we were trying to get on camera, and we messed up, we couldn't get it, and so, make a long, longer story, a little bit shorter, uh, Two days later, Seth killed an awesome deer, and so we went back, and uh, we gave that deer time to rest. We went back to that where we saw that first deer, and Mike spotted him. We made a talk on him, and I made about a oh, I was about a 250-yard shot and dropped him in his track. So that was, you know, it's probably about a 175, 175-inch mule deer, wow. and uh, I'll, I'll always remember that story as well. Yeah, that sounds like a, a definitely a memorable hunt. Um, yeah. Now, on each episode of brush country monsters you are the host so to speak at least that's how it's described are you when they say host do they mean that you're you're not necessarily hosting the show but you're you're taking everybody else out to hunt is that accurate well no well no both of them are accurate okay Uh, jay i mean i i when i'm at the no hills um i'll take out one of the hunters we'll usually have four hunters at a time and i'll take out one of the hunters and since we started the tv show we started filming uh but i don't necessarily have to be on the hunt i will host show every week and uh, i'll introduce the show introduce the the people that are going to be on the show and then i'll close the show uh and probably we make 13 shows in the season and i'll probably hunt on three or four of them and the rest of them because of the unique situation we have with the no wheels where people come to us and hunt uh some people uh, and i don't mean it badly i said they got an ego and they like to be on tv well that just that, that feeds our uh, our script what we need we need content right so if uh you know and it's always the guys enjoy going home and saying hey next fall i'm gonna be on, gonna be on Monster, tv you're gonna get to watch my hunt right that's cool that's a cool thing yeah it is cool yeah it is cool yeah that's a heck of a selling feature now brush country monsters i mean the the name as you have described in the brush country that makes sense when did you decide to take the hunting at the ranch to a television show type format well, it's pretty easy to explain that. We, uh, uh, you know, agriculture was getting a little tough, and uh, that's why I went up there and started running that ranch, and then we never had a problem selling out the hunt. Uh, Jackie told us how much we wanted, how much, how many deer he wanted to shoot, and then we sold them, and, well, one year we didn't sell out. Huh. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the show, The Buck of Uh That's a TV show that's originated down there, and uh, Gary Swart and uh, his partner, uh started this show about Buck Second Money doing this. And so Jackie was talking to Gary one day and, and saying, you know, we didn't sell out this year. And he said, well, you know, Jackie, most of our hunts now come from the TV show. People see the TV show and then they call because they want to come hunting there. And so Jackie called John Burrow and said, I need a TV show. And just by coincidence, Seth Johnson and, and John had just started a new Outdoors Interactive, a, a company of a production company that they were going to start mainly building websites and doing advertisements and helping people get, you know, brochures and building a website. Uh, and so that he had a partnership with Seth and just so happened Seth liked to hunt. Mm. So the next thing you know, uh, Seth is uh, our producer. Sir, and he's uh, just asked John, Jackie, and I started the show from that. You know, that's where it started. That's how it came up. Gotcha. Very cool. So it, it's really based around the idea to sell out more hunts so that you don't go not selling out again, basically. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if that's a limit to deal, uh, we can't shoot them all up in the hills because we've got to shoot too many deer for a TV show. And so a lot of times what we'll do is uh, we'll go to XYZ out there and say, you know, we have a TV show in 40-some-odd million homes. Uh, you give us a deer or give us a hunt or we make a deal for a hunt and we'll promote your operation and 40 million people will see it. Great. So it's good for them. It's uh, so, good for and, you. And, gotcha. Yeah, we get the content and they get the exposure. Gotcha. Uh, and and, and 
ever, you know, if you can barter in this world, in this economy, it's good. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a barter type sure. economy. So you're, you're not always <laughs> hunting on the ranch. You get to go to other spots and because yeah, of, we, we go to, uh, last year I went, I had three trips over 20 days, uh, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, Iowa, Illinois, uh, and, and then the rest around Texas. Gotcha. Uh, we got bigger, bigger plans coming up for next year. So, so the ranch was kind of the foundation and then you've expanded into that because the TV show yeah, right. has right. become a, a success in a sense. Yeah. Right. Um, it, and it has become a success. Uh, you know, Seth Johnson is uh, a 37 year old college professor uh, that has a real knack, a, a gift to make these shows. And if you watch our show, we take a lot of pride in the production of it. Um, and for instance, last year, our show was nominated for two Emmys. Right. And uh, Seth walked around like a peacock with his feathers out, rightfully so, but uh, we didn't win, but we got nominated. Right. That's great. I mean, that's that yeah. means that you're doing something that's high quality. No question right, about right. it. Right. Um, as far as like the the TV show, you were on Sportsman's Channel, correct? Yeah, yeah we were on Sportsman's Channel. We just uh, we were on the first five years. We were on Sportsman, and we just moved over to the Pursuit Channel. Um, they, uh, as an old Godfather movie, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse. Uh, starting uh, June thirtieth, we're going to be on the sport. I mean, on the Pursuit Channel five times a week. And uh, that's awesome. We got uh, yeah. Well, our shows are the, the weekday shows have not been packed yet as far as time, but we're on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10 p.m. And then we're going to have three afternoon shows during the week. Boy, that, that's so, a dream come true. So you're just going to get a lot of airtime, which is great for sponsors. Get, and Right. And absolutely. And that's, that's what, like I said, they made an offer we couldn't refuse. And, uh, and, and, and they had always made us an offer, but they weren't HD. And, uh, right. But they, they are HD now. They came to us and said, all right, we're going to be HD. And they said, all right, make us an offer. And we said, all right, we'll take it. <laughs> it's interesting you say that because that's been kind of one of our, our, for whatever reason, we've been on this theme about HDTV. And uh, it's taken a while for the hunting channels to kind of progress there some did some didn't and many still aren't on many distrib- distribution channels um why, why do you think that is why do you think they're taking such a long time to get there I don't know what it is, but, you know, you put two shows side by side. I mean, and I'm blessed to be able to hunt some of the most beautiful country in the world. And why not look at it in HD? Uh, you know, it just, it just makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, it, maybe, it, you know, I don't understand the production end of it as far as that is with the network. You'd have to talk to us about that. But, you know, maybe it's more expensive or maybe it's more of a hassle or uh, maybe people can't deliver, you know, the, all the cameras out there aren't. But, you know, we don't have a real high budget for what we do. Uh, our camera equipment is expensive, but it's not you know astronomically crazy uh so you know I, I basically I, I think you'd have to ask somebody that knows a little bit more about it it's, it's bound to be money you know in this economy and world everybody seems to worry about money so sure. i would think it'd have to be a money problem yeah i'm sure it takes money to to transfer over to an hd format right. yep uh right. no question about it now where do you want to take the show where do you want to take it from here well i you know on a, on a selfish personal level i'd like the, the show to be able to uh maybe you know i'm 62 years old the next few years i'd like to maybe stop farming and let the show supplement some retirement, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I still go around and, you know, if I didn't have farm half a year, I could I could retire, work half a year, and, uh, you know, get to hunt. Makes total sense to me. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not quite there yet, but it, that's yeah. that's in the, the future. I can uh, definitely see that. Well, you know, great, but, great but they, yeah. yeah, but, you know, the history of TV shows, they don't last all that long. Uh, you know, you're going to be a Larry Washington or a, a Real Tree or, or a, a Waddell or somebody like that. They seem to, you know, Jim Shockey. Uh, uh, they've got a niche and they got in there and uh, they, they got their teeth in it and they they, they make pretty good money. Um, we're uh, you know we we it's just like any business that that, that you got you know you got to put your time and effort in. Uh, and our show right now is get to a point where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and we think it's going to work and we're gonna we're gonna ride it as long as we can anyway. Nice. Now let's say I'm a hunter and I want to come hunt the ranch. What do I have to do? You need to call John Burrow with the High Adventure Company. Okay. Uh, uh, it's just gonna look up the High Adventure com and he'll have his, his uh, phone number on there. Just call him and tell him you were talking to Lamar Smith or you saw a TV show and you want to come hunt the Nice. Now, the ranch that we see in a lot of the videos from the 
helicopter point of view. That's the is that the the headquarters of the ranch when you get down there? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the head, headquarters. One of our cameramen have one of those uh, remote control helicopters you can put a GoPro on. Oh yeah, uh, and, like and, a, and, a little know, drone and, type of thing. You fly right, out. Right, one of those little drone type of deals. Nice. You know, it's just make for make for a real artistic shot. Yep. Uh, you don't necessarily use it when you're hunting, but uh, you know when you're building up a B-roll or uh, you know doing some spots of the opens and closes, and you know, like I say, we, we go in for a quality of production, and that's one of the one of the tools we use to make it quality. Nice. Uh, but yes, that, to answer your question, yes, that, that's a no wheels lodge. Very cool. Can you walk us through a typical day of hunting at the lodge? Like, yeah, g- uh, sure. I mean, it's, uh, when, if you come down, we got a few glass of beer you can shoot. Uh, the hardest to find, the hardest to get in the, is because they sell out so quick. Is the classic, and okay. it basically, you know, it's a 155 inch deer. Okay. Uh, and then we have a management buck which goes up to 140, uh, and sometimes they can, you know, give a few points over that, you know, sometimes we have, we got our genetics where sometimes a management buck can be something that we don't necessarily want on the ranch, but it still supports 145, you know, and more power to you, it's yours, so. Gotcha. Uh, how do you decide a what's a, hunt. Oh, sorry? sorry, how do you decide what a management buck is, like, when you, des- what's the difference? Age is first. Okay. Uh, you know, it can be a, uh, you know, a, a short time 10 point that'll score 140, uh, you know, it's a, it almost sounds snooty, but we we don't want that to breed, but mm. in most people's book, that's a that's a pretty nice trophy. <laughs> yeah. Oh heck yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, uh, we like long times. We like wide, I and mean, we like heavy horns. Uh, you know, uh, a six-year-old deer that's scoring 140, he's probably not going to be any bigger. So that's going to be you know a, a manageable. But, uh, or if we've seen a deer for all three years looking the same, that's going to be manageable. But uh, you know, and, and an eight point, three three to five-year-old eight point is going to be a management buck. Gotcha. Uh, Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Let's continue on with a typical right. day at the ranch. Okay. And, right. And then uh, it's a two-day hunt, all inclusive. All you got to do is have a hunting license. Uh, if you're going to be on my TV show, uh, you have to use my equipment. Uh, I've got sponsors that you know expect to see their product on our show. Sure. Uh, so they, uh, but if you're not, but you come in, um, you come in on a, at noon one day, like a Friday afternoon. It's a three-day hunt. Yep. You hunt Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday, and Monday morning. Then another crew comes in. You get you get uh, three mornings and three afternoon and gotcha. then uh right and then uh you get up we'll have a, a slight breakfast you know a biscuit and a sausage uh we'll get in the blind 30 minutes before daylight uh, sit there until 9 30 or 10 uh come in and have a usually a, a great big breakfast which you know some terms they call it a brunch yeah nice uh, depending on the weather uh it can get hot south texas you got uh, sometimes it'll be 90 degrees in a 30 mile an hour south wind well there's not much sense in going out we will go out if the client wants to but after usually if they hunt with us very long they 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 don't guide the guy. They understand. Uh, you got a relaxing day. We've got a pond there behind the house or can you just read or whatever. And then we go back out about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I get go back to the noon hunt. If it's a good day, if it's weather, if the rut going on, we'll go back in the blind from about 11.30 till about 1. Then come back in. If the guy wants a sandwich, it's fine. You know, stretch your legs, come back. Then we'll go back about 3 and then we'll hunt to the dark. Nice. Uh, and you do that in the morning, you know, the whole time you're there. Now, if you shoot one the uh, first afternoon, yep. uh, you know, sometimes we'll get you to help us with the dough uh, we got some javelina occasional wild hog uh, okay well, um, well you yeah, go back to that you know just because you kill a deer you still get to your full three days uh, other things we can shoot and uh, the Novios Ranch is a great place even if you don't shoot something else you're going to see some awesome animals that's awesome it sounds like a lot of fun actually I could see myself uh, kicking back down there and doing some hunting and, uh, yeah. well, well it is and, and one thing you have to understand and people understand it after a while when they come down to this you're going to see some deer that you cannot shoot right uh, uh, that's one of the other emails we get occasionally is, you know, why did you shoot that 140 that was 100 yards over the back of the 170? Well, mm. that 170 may have only been five years old, and that 140 is what the guy paid for, and that 140 may be eight or nine years old. Ah, gotcha. Uh, All right, that so, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, uh, we don't, uh, the deer, uh, a good deer on our ranch does not get killed before his time. If he does, it's an accident. Right, right. Well, that's great. That's great management, and it uh, in- ensures for bigger, better deer populations and better hunts right. and yeah just absolutely sounds like you're doing it right down there absolutely um well, lamar this, this has been a pleasure and i want to thank you for for being on the big buck registries podcast um how can people reach out to you should we contact you or should we contact the rancher or, or what's the plan there 
Yeah, if you want to hunt the Mill Hills, uh, uh, we, that, that's John Burrow's uh, area. Yep. If you call John Burrow with a high adventure company, and give them a call. Uh, if I can help you, uh, you can leave me a message on Facebook. Uh, or you can, you know, my send me a personal message on there or just reply to the website. And then uh, if it's a direct question to me, the producer will send it to me and we can get in touch that way. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate it. And if this has been fantastic, thank you very much for being on the show. All right. I was, it was my pleasure and it was, it was, it was a real treat. And you guys are sound like you're just as professional as Brush Country Monsters is. And I enjoyed it. Oh, that's, awesome. a, that's the ultimate compliment right that's there. That's awesome. fantastic. That's, that's great to hear. Very cool. All right, guys. Enjoy it. All right. Thanks, Lamar. Well, thank you to Lamar for joining us on the Big Buck Registry. I feel like I've learned some stuff tonight about hunting Texas that I didn't know. Uh, I'm ready to go to the brush country and check this out. I am too. I think it's just, uh, it's on the bucket list, to be honest, to hunt Texas. It's just such a big state and it's so American, even though it's on the border there, but it's such a piece of Americana. That's the kind of stuff I love to experience that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it it made me think of different, you know, th- th- there's all kinds of different ways to hunt whitetails out there. And we just learned a new one tonight. Yes. And Lamar gave us some insight of how not to walk through the, the brush country because it'll tear you up. I think, so, I, I think, I think if I go to Texas, I'm, <laughs> I'm really practicing on my shot, you know, cause I don't want to have a bad shot and have yeah. to wait all the stickers. Yeah. You want those drop shots. <laughs> you know what I mean? The right. One, yeah. The ones that where they don't run away that kind of thing yeah absolutely you know it'd be almost scary to bow hunt there because you got to wade through all this all these thorns and stickers and sounds like it tears you up pretty good if you're not properly uh attired for it yeah yeah not like what i'm used to around here that's for sure Right. No, absolutely not you know here it's uh you make a a great shot that the deer runs a long way on you just walk and get him that's right you know there it seems like you you need to have some special pants and um, be real careful as you go through. <laughs> yeah, I, just just something I'm not really familiar with, and I'm probably come up all torn up no matter what I do. But yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I'm glad Lamar was able to kind of share his insights into uh, that whole thing. So yeah, we thank Lamar for that, and uh, thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed it. You know, hey, I, I got to tell you, I, I picked up uh, uh, another tip in my mind that I'm going to put out there tonight. You got a tip? I got a tip. You know, dude, I, you're like the man with the tips. It is something that, that comes natural, I think. It, it, this is a tip tonight that, you know, I can't stress enough. Everybody says, oh, I go in, I set my, my tree stand up, and that's where I hunt all year. But I've been seeing this buck across the field. Well, let me tell you something. My tip is if you go in, you hunt two nights, you see a buck across the field that's a shooter, and you want to get on him, mm-hmm. move your setup. Don't hesitate. Go move your stuff. It, really? It, you know, it's just a chance you got to take. you got to move your setups. Why is if, that? If you, tell me more about that. Why? Yeah. You know, it's a proven fact that the deer are, are pattern. You're able to pattern them. So when you see a buck using a particular pattern or a particular trail, as I should say, if he's coming out that trail night after night, you need to get to that trail. You know, he's going to come there again. He feels comfortable. That That's his comfort zone. You need to get in that comfort zone and, and get a shot off on him and, and harvest that nice buck that you've been watching across the field. Move your setup. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very good. Um, what's going on at Chubby Times? A lot. A whole lot. A whole, whole lot. I know you've got a lot going on. You've got sponsors and people asking you to, to uh, promote their stuff. And what's what's new? What uh, what do we need to know about? You know, the, the deer that's that's coming this season that people are going to be posting their harvest pictures of is going to be phenomenal. Mm. The, the velvet bucks that I've seen is going to going to be some awesome awesome deer once they shed that velvet and i'm coming you know we've got some guys out of kentucky that posting up some velvet bucks and wow holy smokes really? they're gonna be some they're gonna be some studs are big you, bucks are you hunting kentucky this year i'm, I'm thinking that i'm gonna to try to get there absolutely okay. i, I want to get my ohio tag filled but yet then again i like to be sitting in kentucky on opening morning maybe at a chance at a velvet whitetail i've never i've never harvested a velvet buck I have never either, um, now that you mention it. I've had one opportunity years ago, and it was one of the larger deer I've seen in New Hampshire, and I had scouted out this spot with a couple of friends, and I had set up, um, basically, you, as you walk down some old logging roads, and there was a split, and I went to the, to the right, and I found a spot that it seemed like the deer were crossing, and I had uh, got up as high as I could, I was on the ground, but in a higher position, and few doe moved through, and 
was looking uh, not to fold the tag just right away because it was opening day, but it was actually kind of cold. It was, for whatever reason, it ended up being a cold day. And I watched the doe kind of pass. A smaller deer came through, and then I heard a crack right behind me. I was like, hmm, that sounds like another deer. But it wasn't going through the doe trail. It was coming up over the hill behind me. And I turn around, and I'm literally eye to eyeball, like within a few feet of this deer. He's just coming up over the ridge where I'm sitting. I've got no time to draw. I've got I can't even react. He's just we're just staring at each other, and it's like we're on the same plane. So he's coming up one side of the ridge. I'm on the other side of the ridge, and he's we're looking at each other, eyeball 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 about ten feet away. And I don't know what I'm supposed to do because I've never come that close to a deer in such a surprise moment. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And I look at his eyes, but then I look up and, and and I'm not looking up very much. He's, he's got this nice tall, he's, he's probably a good eight pointer, but really tall rack and it's all velvet. Really? Yeah. So if you can imagine if you just came around the corner of a building and you're just in all of it and you bump into somebody, that's kind of what it was like for both of us. Right. It's like, whoa, I mean, it was a cool moment. It was a very cool moment. It was a stare down contest between me and him on his his level, you know, on the ground. Yeah, what's what's really cool is like you know what the deer are, but does the deer know what you are? Yeah, there is just as confused. He looked confused. He's like, Wait, right. What are you doing? Uh, here? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, and he eventually got spooked and, and ran away. Um, I wouldn't say eventually. It happened quick. Like once he saw me and I was in his path. He wanted to get the heck out of there. Right um, on, yeah. And he he bolted. And I ended up seeing him one other time on the on the other side of that mountain that we were hunting. Um, he came down the hill. I just never got a shot at him, but I saw his antlers moving through the woods. And that was it. That was the last time I saw a velvet that I had a shot at. So that'd be awesome to find a new one. Crazy. Yep, crazy stuff. Yeah, velvet buck said something on my bucket list. I want to shoot a velvet buck. That's something I want to do. Yeah. It'll happen. Same time. Here. Time is the essence. All right, man. How do we reach you? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Come over, check us out. Shoot us a picture. Shoot us a message. Shoot us a question. We'll, we'll take it all. Nice. Yay. How can, how can they reach you at the Big Buck Registry? All right. BigBuckRegistry.com. Uh, if you want to submit a picture, we have a brand new setup, and it gives you all the instructions. Go to BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash my buck. If you want to submit a picture to be on the Big Buck Hall of Fame, and just follow the instructions. We'd have some rules, not a lot, but just a couple. Um, if you want to call us, 724-613-2825, that's our feedback line. Or if you want to text in a buck there, um, tell us a story, whatever. And uh, as of today, Dusty and I are kind of starting to open up these uh, call-ins, these random call-ins. If you'd like to call us up, we held our first one today. We got one caller. And we had a great conversation. Uh, yeah, so. absolutely. You know, and join us. We want we want to we want to talk to our listeners. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, you know it's gonna it's gonna get better and better as we go. And I think we're going to we did a half hour today, and I think we're going to open up to an hour. You know, you get on you you talk hunting. Uh, you know, you get yeah. to it's pretty much like a live feed with Jay and myself, and you know we get to know our listeners a little bit. And yeah. We recommend that you call in. We really want to talk to you. Yeah, and at some point, I'd like to just open up like a Google chat room kind of thing. Um, where you actually jump on Google Plus and you hang out and you actually use your the video camera on your, your computer and you just sit there and you talk. And you just talk hunting and just like you're sharing stories at Deer Camp. That'd be awesome. It would be awesome. Oh man, another great show. Thank you again to Lamar. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait.